do you think we have so um, messed up the dialogue between science and faith, we actually need to rebrand it? You'd like to see us drop the word creationism, intelligent design, theist evolution, and, uh, and go with biologos. Why? Well, I think a lot of the words have acquired so much baggage now that it's hard for reasonable people to have a conversation without misunderstanding each other. It is, in fact, a great tragedy of our time, in my view, that we've arrived at this juncture where science and faith are being put forward as somehow in a battle with each other. For me, as a believer who's also a scientist, I don't see those conflicts. I find it quite comfortable to say, okay, science is teaching us how God created, but not why. You need faith for that. Theistic evolution is one way of describing a part of this, which is that God used the process of evolution to create all of the living things around us and ourselves. And who are we to say that was a dumb idea? It's an incredibly elegant way to achieve those goals. If God inhabited that process in a certain way that made it clear that God's plan is being carried out, uh, well, hooray for that. Why should we be so threatened by such a model? But theistic evolution has turned a lot of people off. People aren't quite sure what a theist is sometimes, and evolution sounds like it's the noun, and theistic is the adjective. So maybe we need to start over. My, my, my modest suggestion is that we're, what we're really talking about here is bios, the Greek word for life, through the logos, God's word, as in the first words of the book of John, in the beginning was the word. And in that way, perhaps putting those together, we could call this biologos, and at least it wouldn't have baggage that would confuse people that it meant something other than what it does. Dr. Collins, you are an evangelical Christian, just as I would be comfortable describing myself. You came to that as a conversion point in your life. Tell me about that. Why? I was not raised in a home where faith was practiced. It wasn't denigrated, but it wasn't considered very important. And I became an agnostic and then an atheist when I was a graduate student studying chemistry. But then I went to medical school and encountered life and death up close and realized that my atheism seemed pretty thin next to the faith of some of these people who were facing the end of their lives and seemed not afraid. And one afternoon, one of my patients asked me point blank what I believed, and I realized I didn't have a good answer. And that was very uncomfortable, and it was time to do something about it. To my surprise, as I began to try to understand what believers think about life and death and God, I realized that there was a great deal of reason behind belief. I had assumed that this was just one of those things you had to shut off your intellect and accept faith because that's just the way it was. I read C.S. Lewis's marvelous book called Mere Christianity, which opened my eyes uh, to the fact that faith and reason actually go hand in hand and ultimately discovered that atheism is the least rational of all the choices. The assertion of a universal negative, which Chesterton pointed out, is a pretty daring dogma. And over the course of time, and it took me a couple of years, began to realize that God's existence is entirely reasonable. In fact, it is much more plausible than to deny it. Searching through the world's religions, I encountered the person of Jesus Christ, who not only claimed to know about God, but to be God, and who promised to solve a problem for me, which was my own lack of perfection, which might otherwise keep me from being able to approach the God that I had just begun to recognize. And so I became a Christian at age 27. All right. Basic Christian doctrine, God is omnipotent and mm -hmm. all-loving. What have you discovered that either proves or disproves that? I think proof is probably something that we are not given the chance to be able to achieve when it comes to matters of faith. We can't prove God's existence and we can't prove what God's nature is like. We can see the evidence for it, but it's not a proof. Certainly, believers and non-believers ask the question, if God is omnipotent and all-loving, why do people suffer? When I've had my own experiences of personal suffering or watched others go through things much worse, I ask those questions too. Sometimes those sufferings are, of course, induced by our own actions, and we can't blame God for that. But sometimes it's hard to see how human activity has resulted in a child with cancer or people being injured in an earthquake. So what is that about? One simply has to step back and say, perhaps there is more to us than what we can see here in our glimpse of time here on this planet. And certainly there are times where we learn through experiences that we would not have chosen much more about ourselves and about God than we might have if everything had gone swimmingly every day. 
You're going to turn a few people upside down on their belief structure, people who've believed in creationism and that they came from this made in the image of God, Adam and Eve are going to disagree with you, and those who believe they are descended from apes are going to be disagreeing with your views of science and faith. What would you say to those of us who you, your view of science and faith turns us upside down? Well, I would ask people to step back from preconceived notions and make sure that the principles they're standing upon are actually God's principles and not human principles that have been added along, because we humans are pretty good at that. Again, I'd refer people to the website that has just been launched that addresses almost all the questions we've talked about in this interview, and that's www.biologos, B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S dot O-R-G, where you can see a deliberation about those issues. Again, if you go back 1,600 years to Augustine, you will not find a thoughtful theologian who had nothing to worry about from Darwin because he wouldn't come along for a very long time. You will not find this person defending young earth creationism as a necessary conclusion from Genesis. Genesis has two creation stories, by the way, and they don't quite agree with each other. Shouldn't that have been a warning against a literal interpretation that so many now consider to be the litmus test of a true Christian? We've put ourselves in a box here that is unnecessary on the basis of Scripture and which, frankly, is driving many young people away from the faith. Dr. Francis Collins, uh, author of The Language of God, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you.